Thank you for your ministry through the singing of God's Word. Thank you for your faithfulness to Him. Uh, as Dr. Golson said, the, the uh, video yesterday was um, a tribute to God's grace and God's mercy to a country, a place that is bereft of the gospel. And uh, thankful for David Hasefluk and others who, whom God has sent there to minister for, for his glory's sake and ultimately for the salvation of, of many souls there. I trust that it was a, had impact in your life. It sure did in mine. Uh, sure does in mine. And I don't want that, uh, that pattern of life to ever be lost on us as a, as a college family. We need that. We need to be challenged. I need to be challenged. It's easy for us in, in our little world to be consumed with academics and all the pressures and praying for spring break to come really, really fast. Uh, and I'm the same way. Uh, as I've said many times, the faculty want it just as badly as you do. Uh, they're, they're ready for that spring break, too. So uh, it's coming. It's coming soon. And uh, all of a sudden, Friday will be here. I trust it will be a, a great time of, of rest, relaxation uh, for you as you, as you head home. Will you turn your Bibles, please, to Titus chapter 2? Titus chapter 2. While you're turning, I do want to say a special word of welcome to several guests that we have. Uh, they're seated right here up front, and I'll embarrass them and make them stand up just for a minute. If you'll hold your applause till we, I announce all of them, that would be great. We have Pastor Mrs. Dave Buckley from... Cross Plains Bible Church in Cross Plains, West Virginia. You guys don't stand up. Pastor Mrs. Troy Calvert from Fairfax Baptist Temple in Fairfax, Virginia. And we have two members of the staff from Bible Baptist Church in Romeoville, Illinois, Pastor Steve Baker and Mr. Brian Keith, who is the uh, administrator for their school there. They're guests of, of, of ours for the next couple of days. Let's welcome them so much. We have the opportunity to bring in uh, pastors throughout throughout the year, just as our guests want them to be exposed to Clearwater Christian College, and that's what they're doing here. If you know them, please feel free to come up and say hi, even if you don't. Uh, but they're they're going to be here for the next couple of days. We're so glad that they can be. The title to my message this morning is "Grace to Live." Grace to Live. Um, you know, there's a number of Old Testament examples that say something like this. They found grace. They found grace. One of those is Noah. Noah found grace. Noah the drunk. After he found grace, he got drunk. Moses found grace. It says over and over again in uh, Exodus chapter 33 talks about his finding grace and sort of a, a conversation, if you will, between Moses and his maker. And the Bible clearly says Moses found grace. And Moses had an anger management problem. Uh, he, remember, if you remember, he struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock and because of that was denied entrance into the promised land, which flies in the face sometimes of our sometimes aberrant view of grace, which says there's never any consequences. Grace is always covers over the consequences. No, that's not true. There are consequences of, of actions. And, and the ultimate consequence for our sin has been taken care of by Christ's death on the cross. But that does not obviate the, the potential for consequences in this life of our sin and our stupidity. And uh, that, that's going to happen. There are natural results of actions. And Moses and Noah figured that out. Gideon was another one that the Bible says found grace. And the Bible, the, the fact that he was threshing his, uh, his grain in a, in a place that was hidden from the Midianites, he was, he was afraid, he was scared to death, and yet he found grace. All of those are, are encouragements to me because I know my own heart and I know I need God's grace desperately. I am a recipient of His salvation grace. But I need His ongoing grace. I desperately need that for my decision making, for my life, for my 
uh, for my children, for the college family, for all of us, we desperately need God's grace. And what is it about this grace that, it, that, is, that is so hard for us to get a handle on? Why is it so, so many times so difficult for us? And I've I got to tell you, I'll just in, by way of introduction, and I say this across the country all the time, and I've said it to you over and over again, your generation, as, as well as my generation, but yours specifically, is, is being attacked endlessly with the attractions that this world has to offer. And they're so accessible to you. You have them. They're, they're, they're at your disposal all the time. I mean, they're just at, at, on your phone, uh, in, on the computer, wherever. I mean, you know, there's, there's so many things to distract. And, and some of them are good things, of course. Um, I am a, a sports, well, I won't call myself a junkie, but I really, really like sports a lot. And uh, I filled out my brackets. I had Kansas winning. That's a problem, all right? Uh, Kansas is not going to win this year, uh, so I am not going to win the, the, the bracketology or whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's not going to happen. And, and, and I got, uh, you know, but I love to do that. I love to watch the games. I love to hear what's going on. I'm a sports nut. And to be honest with you, my temptation is for athletics to take too high of a place in my life. Now, there's nothing wrong with athletics. There's nothing wrong at all with that. But that's the point. The point is Satan has been masterful at just distracting us, not necessarily with bad things, but with things and getting our mind off of the most important stuff. And that is on Him, on Jesus Christ, on what we're supposed to be focusing on. And, and we, have, we have bought into that whole concept that, that I can live my life this way and it's not really hurting me very much and, and it's going to be okay. And I would challenge you to resist that with all that you have and to recognize that it cannot be us just saying, I'm going to just roll through life. Yeah, I've got to, my classes. I've got to do all those things. I've got to come to chapel. I've got to do all these things. But I just want to be done. And may I tell you that the, the, a lot of you have a um, significant amount of pressure on you right now. My wife and I disagree about this, so I'll, I'll give you my side and then I'll tell you her side. Uh, she would say that the pressure in college was greater than the pressure that she has felt after college. I would say it's not even close. All right, I would say I, the pressure after college has been much greater than the, than, the, than the pressure that I had during college. But there's the, the point is this. Cheer up. It's probably going to get worse. All right? It, most likely, you're, you're going to have the pressures that you feel right now are just but a small indication of what's going to happen in the future. So you just load on to the pressure you feel right now, the family responsibilities, the having to, to, to work full time, uh, uh, all of those things that you're being part of a local church ministry, all of those things that are going to be pressuring you to... And, and at the end of the day, the Bible says we are supposed to walk with grace. And so I ask you to, to focus for, for just a moment on, on Titus chapter 2. And Titus 2 gives us a kind of a challenge. The, first, the whole book of Titus is, a, is actually to a, to a pastor. So we say, well, maybe not as, as applicable to you and to me, but I would, I would say it is definitely applicable. In fact, the context of Titus 2 is saying, this is how the old women were supposed to exhort them. This is how the old men were supposed to exhort them. This is how the young women and, and the young men. And, and that's, the, that's the context rolling up to the passage we're going to look at. This Titus, this is what you're supposed to tell to all of the groups in the ministry. Here's what you're supposed to do. And now he, we come to uh, Titus 2.11. And I'm uh, reading from the English Standard today, but I want you to really get this focus in your mind. Try to follow the, the, the logic of what he's, what he's saying, what Paul is saying to Titus. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. It could be said, the grace of God has appeared to all people, bringing salvation. Verse 12, training us. This grace trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, 
and godly lives in the present age. That self-controlled word is said several times above there in, in the challenge to the different groups of people. Verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness, the grace of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by the grace, by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. May I read the passage, the, the focus of this passage, of verses 11 and 12, chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce, to say no to ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And my question to you, young people, is, is that an evidence in your life? Is that the kind of grace that you're experiencing that challenges you to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age? When I think of, of all of us, but specifically if I could challenge the young men for a moment, that self-controlled thing is for us men, and it's for you, young men. What is your, your testimony of self, being self-controlled on our campus with your friends? I mean, that has to do with all sorts of things. It has to do with your relationships with young ladies. Are you, are you evidencing self-control? It has to do with your, your, how you're acting on the soccer field or basketball court or, or baseball field. It has to do with that. It is a huge thing that we as men have, that is the, the pressure point that Paul is putting on to Titus saying, you make sure you tell the young men to be self-controlled. Why? Because that's probably our biggest area of failure. We have a tendency, men, to fall apart in this area of self-control. And it has to do with, it, you can just go across the board, virtually every area we have, a, we have the weakness, most of us, men. That's not just men, but that's the focus for a moment. We men have that problem. Lack of self-control. And Paul is saying, all right, you've got this grace now. You've got this salvation grace. But you've now got sanctifying grace that is there to help you to stay self-controlled. You say, well, how do, I, how do I get to that? How do I understand that grace? Well, let's first of all, do a definition. I gave this to you several weeks ago, and I'm going to give it to you again because I hope that this definition of grace will grab a hold of your hearts and you'll, you'll say, am I living a life that, that is captured by this kind of grace? I found this a, a while ago, but this is, this is the definition of grace that I found. Of the merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, strengthens, and increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, and affection, and kindles them to the exercise of Christian virtues. Long definition. Let me read it again. Of the merciful kindness by which God, exerting His holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, He saves them, keeps, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, and affection, and kindles them, incites in them the exercise of Christian virtues. And my question to you today is, is that grace part of what, 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 what exemplifies you? It, you can, there's a number of different evidences of this grace. Uh, 
1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the, the, the strength. That grace provides us strength to serve God. It gives us the strength to serve Him. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12.9 talks about the infirmities. Paul is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm under these infirmities, but it's God's grace that gets me through. There are some of you suffering through specific infirmities. Maybe you have uh, loved ones who are either unsaved or they are, are struggling physically. Some of you right here are struggling physically right now. And you're not, under sure, you're not sure what's going on. You're not sure what God, why God is doing this to you. And, and the Bible says that we have the grace. It is at our disposal to handle any infirmities that God sends our way. And the only time that, that you can really understand that is when the infirmities come. They don't, that grace is not there for you when you're just living your life in the normal way. But when those infirmities come, God has promised us grace to handle those every single time. And Ephesians uh, 3 verse 8 talks about the grace to be a witness for Him. And I love to hear, I had a young man sent me a, a text recently about the opportunity he had to, to witness to leave a Bible with, 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 with a lady. And that, wow, that's, that's incredible. The more that you do that, the more you're spurring, obviously you're, you're moving forward the kingdom of God, but you're spurring others too. Be that way. Be aggressive in your evangelistic efforts. That is God's grace at work in your life. The evidence of that, it just flows out. It flows out next in your conversation. Will you turn please to Colossians 4, verse 6. Very familiar passage of Scripture. But I want to give special attention to this today. What is God's grace? How is God's grace affecting what you say? Colossians 4, verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. And you know very familiar verse uh, just a few pages over, Ephesians 4.29 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Appropriate speech. The speech uh, said at the right time. This is another one where I, I just want to lay a huge burden on you, okay guys? Guys especially. It's not just guys, ladies too, but especially guys. You're the leaders. Whether you like it or not, people look to you. They listen to you. They listen to what you say. They make judgments about who your God is by what you say. And may I just beg of you to be careful about what comes out of your mouth. Obviously, we know cursing and swearing, that's just, it's, it's in, in the Word of God, that is evidencing a disobedience to God's clear command if you curse and swear. It doesn't matter if only your friends hear you. God hears you. God hears that language coming out of your mouth. And what, what can we say to that? And, and, I, and I'm not suggesting that everyone is perfect here. And that's, that's the, 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 this burden about how we talk. How we talk with our friends. How we interact with each other. That is so huge. That is an evidence of God's grace flowing in us. And if we're not talking in a way that's edifying and pleasing and, 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 and just above reproach, we're evidencing the fact that we don't have that grace. And that grace is not flowing through us. It's not helping us. It's not energizing us. We're, we're, we're suggesting by our language that we don't have that grace. And that grace is, is just it's, it's available if we're truly believers. It's available for us, but we're not using tapping into that grace that is, is available for all of us who know Jesus Christ. What's your language like? What are the things, the words that come out of your mouth? And as I said, certainly cursing and swearing, that, just, that has no place in a Christian's vocabulary. You, you have no ground to stand on in that. And we think, well, well I, I, that's my background. I came out of that. And here's, here's my response to that. I'm not suggesting that everyone is perfect in their speech. But will you battle that? If it's been a lifelong habit of how you talk and how you interact, will you battle that? Will you, will you struggle against 
that. See, the, the, the challenge here is, is if you're not struggling in your Christian life, then what you are saying about your Christian life is there ain't nothing going on. If there's not a struggle, if you think that's no big deal, and I, it's, it's not, why, why is he making such a big deal about this? I'm going to say to you, you're evidencing the lack of grace and maybe the lack of a true saving relationship with, with Jesus Christ. I mean, that is huge. The fact that you fall is not the evidence of whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. It's what you do after that fall. What is your response to God's working in your life? What, how are you responding? Are you responding with grace and, and, a, and an idea that I have nothing to bring to the table? And if I do anything right, it is only because of Jesus Christ and His grace that's flowing through me. Because my tendency is to do wrong. Every time. And I have to battle it, and you have to battle it. And if there's not a battle going on, then please, please, may I beg of you to say, either you have hardened yourself as a believer, or you have hardened yourself as an unbeliever. Either position is a very, very dangerous place to be. We can think about it and think, well, it's not that big of a deal. I'm going to say it is a big deal. It's a huge deal. It's a huge deal to your God. That kind of thing, and, and I'm, I'm just picking on, on language right now, but it, it's pervasive. It's, a, it's across our campus. We need to be about showing grace to each other. Well, see, you don't know my, my teacher. They're not, not showing grace to me. You know, they, they have all these assignments and they expect me to get them done on time. And that's not grace, right? I mean, that's, that's just a, a false view of what grace really is. And the fact that someone holds us to the line and holds us to a standard does not mean they don't have grace. It means they're trying to prepare you for your life. And life is made up of these types of things. And, and I'm, my whole burden today is that you understand what a life lived in grace is about. And, the, and then just tear down those things that, you know, if, if, I, don't, if I mess up and, and I'm held to a, a certain place and I get a consequence about that, there's no grace there. False. Totally false. Now, I know, without a doubt, that I and others, faculty and staff, have probably addressed somebody in a, in a way that was fleshly, carnal. I'm sure we've done that. If you see that, would you do your part in helping us? Would you do what is appropriate and come to the person who has, who has offended you and realize that there's nobody perfect here? There's no super spiritual saints here. Promise. It isn't. We're not there. We're trying to walk with the Lord. We're a little bit more mature because we're old. All right, but but where that is that is not that does not mean that we don't have that flesh that's just driving at us, and so do you. And remember that these people who are put in authority over you are not perfect. They're going to mess up sometimes, and you're going to think they mess up sometimes, and they're not. But the point is, how do you respond? Do you respond with grace? when somebody maybe from your side doesn't treat you right. Our response is not, I'm going to put this out so everybody finds out about it. All right, where is my phone? Uh, and and they're, they're going to find out about how I was treated. And my question to you is, when something like that happens, can you keep your mouth shut and go to the person that has offended you and take care of it that way? And do the biblical, that's, that's appropriate speech. That is grace filled speech. But you don't know what happened. You're right, I don't. Right? But I do know what the Word says. And the Word says, there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will never allow you to be tempted above that you're able. But will with the temptation provide some way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. So none of us has the sight. Well, you don't understand. If you were in my shoes, you would do the same thing. Maybe I would, but that may be just as wrong. And my challenge to you is, in your, in your speech with each other, in your speech with, with uh, the faculty and staff, may it be just seasoned with salt. 
May it be edifying to the hearer. May it be challenging. And, and I, I've shared this with you many times, I know. But but my I have my own euphemism. You know, we have the euphemism is sort of a, a curse word that's been Christianized. Uh, and and we, we do that. And we say, well, this is okay. Well, I'm, I'm not going to be the judge about whether it's okay or not. I'm just not sure about the wisdom of that. My daughter, all the time, because, and you can see, I said all the time, so you can see how much I have a challenge with it. I say the stupid word, shoot. They say, is there anything wrong with shoot? No, I mean, baskets and all that. You know, there's nothing wrong with that word. But my daughter has, Macy, 14-year-old, tells me to stop cursing when I say shoot. And why would she, and, I, and I've tried to explain, that's not, but in her mind, I have said to my family, will you please keep me accountable for this? And she's taken on that burden very well. All right? And she, she every time I say it, and I'm, I'm trying to work on it, I promise. All right? But every time I say that, if she's around, she's going to let me know. She is my uh, conscience, and she's proud of it. Uh, she, she, she likes that. All right? but, and, and you may have someone who takes you on about your speech. Let's not go back at them. Say, you know, maybe something I'm saying is not coming across very well. I'm not giving a great opinion of my God by how I'm responding to this desperate situation. I'm not giving a great opinion of my God by how I'm responding on the basketball court, or on the baseball field, or wherever. I'm not giving a very good opinion of my God by how I'm, I am communicating to my professor. Professors, I'm not giving a very good opinion of God by how I'm communicating to the students. It goes both ways. And we have the responsibility to give a great opinion of who our God is by how we respond to each other. And I've told you this also over and over again. You're doing great today. You minister to the speaker by how you listen. You are ministering to me right now by how you listen. You are ministering grace to me. Thank you for doing that. But may your, our, our speech show that we are full of grace. And then one other uh, passage, 2 second, second Peter 3.18 says, someone who is, is grace-filled will be growing, will be walking with their God. Last verse in, in Second Peter, to grow in grace. Grow in grace. Today should be better than yesterday. Your understanding of who your God is should be better. And right now, I know what's going on. I know that I would, if I had to guess, I would, I would guess that the majority of you right now are really, really struggling with your daily time with the Lord. The majority of you, I bet. Because right now, we're just holding on. You know, we're just holding on until Friday's going to be here. I hate to tell you, the next Monday's going to be here too. All right? It's, it's not going to end. Right? You, have a, you have a respite. That's a good thing. But don't take a break from your time with God. Don't do that. That is that the, the God uses His Word through His Spirit to minister grace to us. He is not going to just automatically give us grace. He gives. He gives through salvation. He gives even in the sanctification process. But it is a joint effort. He allows us to participate in it. And so, in closing, let me uh, just challenge you on two dimensions. How can I have this grace? Number one, ask for it. Hebrews, in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Let us therefore become, come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How are you and I going to have grace? Every day. As you start your day, will you say, will you pray, God, please let my life be filled with your grace. May people who see me and talk with me see that I'm filled with your grace. Lord, I desperately need your grace. And we can boldly come into the throne room of God Almighty and ask that. And He will do it. It's not that we just ask this, this impotent God. He is omnipotent. And He loves us more than we can ever imagine. So He's not going to withhold grace from you and me. He's never going to do that. In fact, He wants to just pour it on. 
and allow you to, to have a, a, a grace-filled response to anything that comes your way. Some of you are wrestling with, with relationship issues and things are just, they're just not going well at all. And you're saying, what? I, I, just, I don't know why God's doing this to me. And I would say to you, regardless of what the circumstances are, He is providing you the grace that you need. If you're a believer, you have the grace that you need to withstand whatever. So number one, to get this grace, ask for it. And number two, Proverbs in three different places, Proverbs 3, James 4, and 1 Peter 5, the Word says He gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to that person who really knows his place or her place. And where is that place? shared this with you before. It, it, it's, it's a true view of the gospel. The gospel is, I am more wicked than I could have ever imagined. But I'm more valued than I could ever hope. That's the gospel. That's humility. That without Christ, I'm nothing. I'm not this big negative. I'm nothing without Christ. And I am everything. He gives grace to those of us who are humble and say, you know, this life is not about me. This life is about Him. And I'm going to live my life that way and I want my, my life to be just so hid in Christ that people don't really see me, but they see the words that come out of my mouth and the reactions that I get are His from Him. That's meat and potatoes Bible. That's not typical of your age group. And I'm calling you out to say, will you stem the tide? You have a humility of of desire and purpose and that you want God's will to be done through your life and you are going to come boldly into His throne room and ask for grace because He will give it to you. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with right now makes no difference. There's two types of people sitting here right now. One, unbelievers. If you're an unbeliever, if you are not a true disciple of Jesus Christ, that is the number one step. There are some here who are unbelievers. You don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior from sin. Please, before it's too late, will you come to Christ? And there are many here who are believers. You know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Will you join me in living like it? Live like you're a believer. Live like there's something at stake. And 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 the Bible said in, in, in Titus, it's saying, looking to Jesus, looking for his soon coming. That was that was penned two thousand years ago. And we're still supposed to be looking to him. What's your motivation in life? What is driving you? May we have God's grace that will superabound in all of our lives so that when someone comes by and talks to us and sees us and when we, they might see us in a very difficult situation and they actually see us mess up like Noah the drunk or Moses the anger man you know, or the weakling Gideon all messed up but you know what? They handled, they, they fought, they handled that biblically. So I'm not calling for perfection here. I'm calling for a life that's walking with God. When we fall down, we confess that, and we get back up, and we move for Him to have a grace-filled life. That's my burden for you, and that's my burden for me. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your incredible ministry in our lives. For those of us who are believers, you are in us. You are very much interested in each decision that we make. There's nothing neutral about it. Lord, I ask that you would help these young people. Lord, the majority want to serve you majority really desire to follow after you. 
The majority want their lives to count. They want a deep relationship with you. Father, please, help them to be real with you. Help us to be willing to confess. Not to just go along another day, another time, another chapel, another day of classes. Got that one done. Lord, I pray that we will, we will not live our lives holding on. But we will live our lives with the, the understanding of how great you are and that you want to pour your grace in us. Lord, there's nothing, nothing better than that. And I pray that you'll help the distractions to be put, pushed aside. And that you would be lifted high in our lives conversation, every aspect as we interact with each other throughout the day. Give us grace, Lord.